So Steve has talked to Dylan at least once. Okay. Hey guys, this is Jules with True Crime Reactions. I know most of you guys were probably expecting my reaction video to Drunk Turkey's recent posting of the information from the Christy Gonsalves interview to come out last night pretty shortly after their live finished. But Friday nights I spend with my kids just watching stupid crap on TV. So here I am today. Good morning. Now, most of you know that I did two reaction videos, as mentioned, to the original interview live that Drunk Turkey did, and I felt it necessary to do two because the information that I reiterated to you guys was missing in the second posting after the live was deleted, and I felt the need to address it because now something that I am speaking out to you guys no longer exists. And I was going to cover my bases on that because I'm not a liar. So whenever this new information came out, yes, I was right there in the live. I was taking notes. I was watching. But I still have issues with this entire thing. And look, I'm going to explain something to you, all of you. I don't owe allegiance to anyone, okay? I am going to call out what I see. And I don't particularly care about how anyone views it as long as I am backing it up with facts and asking questions for clarity to be given, then I am going to continue to ask those questions regardless of who they are aimed at. Okay. Truth seeking is not pretty baby. It's not. Now, one of the big issues that I do have is that there was two things that was in that live that were not addressed in the smaller rendition that he then posted after removing the live. And one of my bigger issues is that only one of those two things was addressed. And the other one is extremely important. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. But I do want to tell you guys that I did receive an email from Drunk Turkey. And this email uh, kind of alluded to them wanting to give me information off the record. And this information was stuff that the family didn't want just out in the YouTube world. And my response to that was, well, if the family doesn't want it out there, then I nor any other creator deserves to know that either. And I just, I don't want to know. I'm not going to be a secret keeper. I'm not going to sit here and take what someone is telling me, someone told them, but don't tell somebody. Like those are those stupid biggest game of telephone issues. And I'm just not, I'm just not going to entertain it. And also, like I said, I don't have allegiance to anything but the truth here. And I am not going to be a part of something being covered up. If it is legitimate information and it pertains to this case, then it should be out there. Okay. So wanting to go off record and all these things because you were told something that someone doesn't want out there, then you should be keeping that to yourself. Okay. You shouldn't be out there trying to like give hints to things. You should be just shutting your mouth. I mean, common sense. And on top of that, I don't really quite understand why there is even or was even discrepancy on if somebody had talked to one of the roommates or not. And the discrepancy continued until the live last night, because whenever Drunk Turkey commented on my second reaction video, the very first sentence is they haven't talked to the roommates. But then in the live, we hear Steve has talked to Dylan, but Christy hasn't talked to either one of them. So I don't understand why all of this is even going on. And if Drunk Turkey, which I'm going to assume the person that commented this was Daniel out of the three that are on that show because he's the main one that Daniel would be claiming in this comment they haven't speak they haven't spoken to the roommates they haven't talked to the roommates but then you come on the live and you say oh Steve's talked to Dylan so why aren't you just putting that in this comment why didn't you just put that in this comment right here live for everyone on the public that sees my video to then read that yes, Steve talked to Dylan, but Christy hasn't talked to anyone. Why is your first sentence a lie? They haven't talked to the roommates. Why? Why? Now, in this exact same comment, Daniel also gives the reason for why the live was pulled. So I am going to read what he stated right here. I pulled it for a completely different reason. Someone asked me if they think Brian Koberger is guilty. People mistook what I said and I perhaps misspoke. Christy is waiting on the results of DNA, won't know till court like the rest of us, to determine whether she thinks he's guilty or not. That's important because 
This has been going on for eight months. Brian Koberger has been in jail for six. They're still waiting on the DNA results. There's no way in hell that after six months in such a very high profile case that those DNA results are not already ready. So if they're waiting on DNA results, that just kind of concretes what we heard from their attorney in the gag order motion hearing yesterday about how the families aren't getting information from the prosecution which we will talk about that in another video and most likely will be today. I do have some thoughts on all of that crazy stuff that happened yesterday, but we almost still see a difference in sentiment here because if Christie's waiting on the DNA results to make a decision, then you kind of have to go back to this newest interview that Steve did for Kaylee J. Day, where he very much makes a bold statement, a bold statement that you can really only make if you have facts to back that up, especially in a death penalty case. Now, in this new interview, and most of you guys probably have seen it, it's the one where he's driving Kaylee's Range Rover to go do good deeds for her birthday, which is a beautiful thing. But in this video, he claims that this was done because Brian was jealous of Kaylee and Maddie. Let me explain something. And it's something that you guys most likely know because most of you have common sense. Normal levels of jealousy does not tempt you to commit quadruple homicide. So if they have proof to back that up, that means love would have been involved in this scenario, doesn't it? So it'll be interesting to see the details of this, to see if in the end, Brian is the guy and there was some sort of jealousy situation because again, only love will tempt you to be so stupid in the midst of your jealousy only love. Now in this live, we did get some new details about Jack D's timeline, according to Christy. And I'm going to read my notes about this to you guys, because I do feel like it's important. And eventually we're going to have to pick a side here. Okay. We cannot keep going back and forth this entire time until trial, just causing more chaos and crazy. A side has to be picked. And I'm guilty of that too. And a lot of times when we get on Dago's channel and we're throwing out ideas and we're talking about discrepancies and trying to fit puzzle pieces together, I find myself saying this to myself and Dago and everyone else that we have to pick something here because it can't be everything. And while there's so many sketchy, weird things in this case, they can't all be the reason why this happened. Something eventually is going to have to stick and start actually guiding this in a direction, only one direction, because this will only end one way with the truth. And regardless of what the truth is, we have to be able to see it. So we've got to start eliminating things that are blurring our ability to see exactly what is going on here. So I'm going to read you guys Jack's timeline, according to Christy. Jack was woken up by a roommate and his roommate's girlfriend alerted that something was going on down the street at King Road. They left and walked down the street. First responders and cops were there with it all taped off when they walked down. Ellie just arrived on scene, so this was right after noon. Jack walked up and said, I'm the ex-boyfriend, and asked what happened, and they informed him that he would need to go straight into questioning. They took his phone, he got out of there really, really, really late, and he did not actually go over to the Gonsalves family home until the next day. He was very heavily questioned, and we also know they took his DNA. They most likely did take pictures themselves, the cops themselves, of his body to make sure there wasn't any markings that looked suspicious, and then they took his phone for a few days. So when it comes to Kim and Dave's timeline, what are we supposed to believe here? Because according to Kim, her daughter knew at 10 a.m., and according to Dave, there were messages on his phone prior to his 9.30 a.m. clock-in time. But Jack was woken up because there was cops at 11.22 King Road. Not because his phone was blowing up, not because people were knowing hours and hours ahead of time. Jack was woken up because people saw cops at Kaylee's house and came into his room to get him. Now, the whole he was woken up by his roommate and his roommate's girlfriend thing is actually an interesting little detail in this, because in Kim's story, the so say alibi 
of Jack and Adam, according to her, this is the alibi in the actual police reporting, went to Pullman to pick up his girlfriend around like eight in the morning. And then I'm going to assume went back to Moscow. Well, that's a four hour gap between getting your chick at eight o'clock in the morning and then telling Jack, hey, there's cops down the road. So I don't know if it's the same alibi person in Kim's story and his girlfriend as the roommate and the roommate's girlfriend in this timeline. But if it is, then that still leaves more questions to that whole part. Because if this is the same roommate and girlfriend as in Kim's story, then why would this girlfriend have known anything at 10 a.m. if they're going in together to wake up Jack at noon? So this is why I'm stating we have to pick a side here eventually because these two stories conflict and we can't have that because we can't have conflictions. We can't have doubts in these kinds of things. And the reason why it is so important that another thing was not addressed in this other video is because it alludes to Dylan's frozen shock phase being bullshit, which we've already called out. I don't even know how many times because when the original live played out, Daniel stated that Christy heard that the reason why the PCA puts the ending time of the incident at 425 a.m. is because Dylan called everyone in the house, meaning Dylan heard, saw something that freaked her the hell out enough to call all of the roommates around 420, 425. And then when she did not receive a response, didn't call 911. And I've mentioned this. You can call and dial all those numbers, but you can't dial three and call 911 and get help. And if they're claiming that she was awake enough, lucid enough in order to make all these phone calls, then 911 could have been called and someone's life could have been saved. And it's proof that she knew at 425 that something horrible had happened in that house or else why are you calling everyone to check and see what's happening why didn't you call for help i'm going to stick to there is a reason why dylan's information does not add up now another something that was said from steve and i will preface this with this because daniel mentioned this after the fact but i'm going to start with this when you go through trauma a lot of your timelines kind of like blur together. And most of you guys know that your brain kind of has like its own filters, I guess, because people that have like really bad PTSD, they have memory problems, really bad memory problems. And that's because your brain will purposely block out sections around your trauma so that you do not have triggers so that you don't remember these things and it puts you through the ringer all over again. So whenever some of this stuff is coming out, we do need to make a conscious decision to be, you know, logical and know that this family is really suffering right now, horribly. But the information still needs to be exact because this is a death penalty case and this isn't just about one person losing their life, it's about four. It's about four families that are trying to figure out exactly what happened to their children. So while, yeah, it's cool, I guess, that Steve and Christy feel so confident in whatever's happening to come out and speak and do interviews and stuff like that, it's not just about Kaylee. It's about Maddie. It's about Dana. It's about Ethan. And the truth needs to be the truth regardless of how it makes anyone look. And that's just the sad part about all this. A lot of people don't want truths to come out about things because of the domino effect of those truths. But in this situation, you don't have a freaking choice. That You don't have that luxury, okay? So do you guys remember whenever Brian Koberger was first arrested and the family did an interview and they claimed that at first they didn't think there was a connection between Brian and anybody, but then after looking some more, they possibly found connections. Well, Drunk Turkey gave some examples of that yesterday. 
But I will preface, like I mentioned, with what I stated, because they are claiming that what I'm about to tell you happened prior to Brian's name being released as the suspect in custody, but it very well could have been just, you know, a few hours after the fact, and people on the internet are assholes. According to my notes, they were aware of Brian's arrest, apparently just a few hours before it actually happened, which we, we did know. They did search and they did find a few media accounts prior to the arrest, which is why I'm claiming and telling you guys trauma timing matters because this could have literally been just a few hours after it was announced and it might not even be valid. So whenever they found these three Instagram accounts under Brian Koberger's name, three, all three of the Instagram accounts were following Maddie and Kaylee. One of the accounts was also following Xana. Every single one of Maddie's posts were liked by these accounts. A whole lot of Kaylee's posts were liked by these accounts. And the account that was following Xana liked a few of Xana's photos as well. And they also claimed that these accounts were completely gone after Brian's arrest. So I don't know. I don't know if they were real or they are they not. I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. But again, we don't see the evidence of what these social media profiles looked like whenever the Gonsalves family found them. And I know for a fact that as soon as Brian's name got released, the idiots of the internet went out and made, I don't know how many thousands of fake profiles on who knows how many freaking websites pretending to be Brian Koberger because it was going to get a lot of search hits. Okay, so... I need validity in those kinds of things. And we know that it's going to come out, you know, during the trial. But did he have social media accounts that was stalking the girls or did he not? Because just like we've ha we're having discrepancies here in the family conversation, we have discrepancies when it comes to the mainstream media's information. News Nation and all these other places are claiming, yeah, he was he was cyber stalking them. This was premeditated and way planned out. And oh, yeah, he was a incel stalker. But then Dateline, who had the information right about the IDs, is claiming, no, he wasn't. Can we just get a straight answer on something, please? Now, the question about how the person who did this would have gotten into the house was brought up. And the parents don't know. And this is another one of those things where they kind of double down on the fact that the prosecution really isn't telling them anything, which we hear that in the gag order hearing from yesterday. That's going to be in the transcript that the families feel they're not getting information from the prosecution. Now, the prosecution is fighting that, obviously, but how do we not have answers to certain things? How is Christy just hearing that Dylan called out to the other roommates at 425 a.m. and she doesn't know from the prosecution for sure that that was the situation? I don't understand the secrecy, like Steve says, when it comes to this case, because if they're so sure they have their man, why haven't they released just one thing that proves his link to any of the victims? Just one, just one little detail to calm all the chaos is all that's needed. And it will not jeopardize the integrity of the case. It will not blur a jury pool if it is precise, verified, and correct information that shows a connection, a valid connection between Brian and the victims, then why not just release it? So much crap could be avoided when it comes to all this so say drama if we just had validity. I mean, how hard can it really be to just make it make sense? And while I do not know what other people were claiming about this interview. I know that in the very beginning of last night's live, they were talking about some of the backlash they got from this. And I heard some things coming out of Daniel's mouth that I know that I didn't talk about. And I can imagine I'm not the only one that did reaction videos to that interview. But he also then states he doesn't understand what all the drama is about because it doesn't have anything to do with the case. But sweetheart, it does because you have yet to repeat what you said about the 425 a.m. phone calls made from Dylan. That is a very important part of this case. Y'all all know how I feel about it, and I will state it again, even though I've already said it in this video. It is proof that she was not in a frozen shock 
phase incapable of calling for help. Someone's life could have been saved. And I know that if that information is true and valid, people are not going to be happy. And if that information is true and valid, I don't know why the families aren't pushing for something to be done for the lack of give a shit in that situation, for the delay in calling for help. Eight hours? You were calling everyone at 425 a.m., but waited eight hours to call for help. It's important. It's not drama. It's a detail that needs to be verified. All that we want here is the truth. And that is the exact same thing that every single one of these families want. So while I do understand that the families want transparency and they want things out there, this is kind of more proof that a gag order might actually be important in this case. Because if there's going to be information coming out from the families and the families are having conflicting statements with themselves, then they probably just shouldn't be speaking. Which is most likely the reason why they want their lawyer to be able to speak for them. These kinds of mistakes won't happen if they have just one person speaking for all of them. So I kind of understand now the reasoning for the motion for the gag order. It seems like it's more of a self-preservation type thing, which there's nothing wrong with that. I... I understand the families wanting to make sure that things are said correctly without all of the crazy stuff, but that part probably should have been handled before an interview is done. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave it there. But those are my thoughts on what was released last night. I want to know what you guys think about the issue of the 425 call not being addressed. Because honestly, I didn't even want to really ask Daniel about it because I don't want a secret answer. I want a very public one because it's important and I'm no secret keeper. See y'all.